Rachel. I hope you can all hear me. It's, it's a real pleasure to welcome Professor Rong Fu today. Uh, she's a professor of atmospheric science at UCLA. She's the vice chair of the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences, and she is the director of GFRES, the regional climate joint institute that UCLA and JPL have. Uh, she got her bachelor's degree in geophysics from Beijing University and a PhD from Columbia University. And before UCLA, she was a professor at Georgia Tech and at UT Austin. She has done amazing research and she received several honors and awards, including being elected as a fellow of the American Meteorological Society, a fellow of the AGU, and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And today she's going to give a distinguished climate lecture on a very uh, exciting topic. The title is Machine Learning Approach Toward a Seamless Understanding of Droughts, Heat Waves, and Fire Weather from Subseasonal to Decadal Scale. Uh, Rong, welcome to JPL, and please take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Joa, for a really kind introduction. Uh, I really like to thank Joa and the Climate uh, Science Center for Climate Science. To giving, uh, for giving me this opportunity and honor to report our recent and ongoing research. And I also like to thank audience to taking time from your very busy schedule to come to this seminar. This seminar, I feel very special to have this opportunity because I start my career as a postdoc at the JPL. And in the past 30 years, I have uh, been constantly uh, learning from scientists at the JPL, and also the friend, I have many friends who really make my journey as a researcher so much fun and uh, enjoyable. So I am very grateful for this opportunity. I like to uh, acknowledge, uh, emphasize the work I'm about to present are actually the work of my postdoc, Dr. Yi Zhou Zhuang. He is the real force behind this research, and I'm very lucky to be able to work with him. The topic uh, is about the weather-climate connection and their potential for improving predictive understanding of the drought, heat wave, and the fire weather. I choose this topic not because I'm an expert in this topic, but because I'm new, uh, especially in terms of a weather. I'm, my research has been really focusing on climate from seasonal up to decadal scale, but the result from our data analysis has led me to appreciate, realize the importance of weather and JPL is really a leading force in uh, research in the subseasonal to seasonal uh, climate research and uh, pre predictability. So you you really have the uh, leading scientists uh, such as like Duen uh, and many others, and they are leader in this area nationally and internationally. So I hope to uh, get feedback. Uh, to learn from these feedback and also uh, explore opportunity for collaboration. Next slide, please. So the extreme events nowadays seem to become annual events. For example, last uh, uh, year we have uh, the largest, the worst fire season in California and uh, also the Western U.S. Um, many of us probably experienced the impact the first hand date. And I recall there was a fire in Arcadia and Pasadena. And I know many of my friends live there. And this year, we are witness once a millennium drought unfolding over Southwest. California, even we're not in the epic center of this drought, we still feel the impact on water resources already. So uh, nationally, uh, the data show that uh, the billion dollars 
whether climate related disaster has been escalating rapidly, especially in recent decades. So therefore, the early warning become more and more important for mitigating these uh, uh, rapidly escalated threat from drought, fire, uh, therefore, um, so that uh, these are very important way to mitigate the cost at the short term. Next slide, please. Yeah. However, our capability to provide early warning is uh, far from adequate. For example, the last summer, July to September, when we had a record higher heat waves and uh, uh, monsoon failure over Southwest, our seasonal forecast says it would be a normal year. They would be actually mild positive uh, rainfall anomalies. And we have a mixed uh, temperature anomalies. Um, most of the places are actually predicted to have a cooler temperature. And more uh, importantly, if we look at the prediction scale as a function of time, we see the decline of the prediction scale for precipitation, even when climate model has been improving. The question is uh, what caused this decline of the prediction scale? There are many reasons, but one of the hypotheses is the, uh, the intrinsic prediction scale very decadally, uh, on a decadal scale, and also the impact of a climate changing if they're not uh, factored into the even seasonal prediction, it could degrade the scale. Next slide, please, yeah. So to address this uh, challenge, the five federal agencies, including NASA, has uh, uh, developed a National Earth System Prediction Capability Initiative aiming at improved prediction scale from weather to decadal uh, time scales. So as we can see that uh, the prediction scale is relatively uh, higher from uh, on the weather scale from days to weeks. And these YD scales are very useful for emergency response. They're not so effective in mitigate the cost of the natural disaster. To really mitigate the cause of natural disaster, we need to have a credible scale at the, uh, for three months on the seasonal or longer time. So this is where prediction scale are really low. Uh, as you was, you can see, uh, we virtually we have no scale. So one uh, promising pathway forward is seamless uh, prediction approach. Um, Seamless prediction uh, approach, the idea behind it is we cannot uh, validate the climate projection in future. So therefore, in order to ex uh, assess the model prediction scale for climate projection, we can evaluate a seasonal prediction for the processes that's important uh, for future climate change. In so doing, we can assess the prediction scale of the model as well as uh, calibrating improve the model and so the prediction of the models. So this concept, uh, since it was proposed about 15 years ago, has become more and more, uh, has been endorsed more and more and adopted by the leading prediction center uh, for weather and the climate, especially through unified weather climate models. However, the uh, observational community, climate diagnostic community, has not been paying much of attention to this approach. So we are still pretty segregated in terms of understanding weather and climate phenomena. Uh, next, yeah. So therefore, the observational basis for evaluate for supporting this uh, seamless prediction approach is actually quite a, uh, sparse. To address this gap, uh, we, uh, as a first step, we would like to explore these questions. 
Uh, first, how to weather subseasonal climate variability, influence drought, heat wave, and the fire weather risk on seasonal intennial to decadal scale. How do climate variability and the change influence weather and the subseasonal variability? Finally, how can machine learning help address these questions? Next slide, please. Oh, uh, that's okay. So the take home message here is the clarify weather climate link is a key for improving predictive understanding of drought, heat wave, fire weather over Western US in a changing climate. And this is true for both weather and the climate prediction. I hope to present evidence to support this uh, statement in the rest of the uh, seminar. Next slide, please. So uh, this presentation uh, has a focus on two questions. First of all, how does weather affect climate? In particular, how does uh, dry spell at weather seasonal scale contribute to drought on the seasonal scale, seasonal and the longer uh, time scale, with a focus on warm season drought from April to September? The second question is, uh, how do climate affect the weather? In particular, how do decadal climate variability and the change affect the weather and the subseasonal climate variability? I would like to address both aspects of the drought and the fire weather. One is the rainfall deficit, dry spell. The other is the warmer temperature and the heat wave, which increase soil moisture loss. The work are mainly based on uh, these two publications and the one ongoing work uh, listed here. Next slide, please. So I started my research uh, with the goal of uh, characterizing the circulation pattern for drought. So we all know this iconic circulation pattern for uh, central U.S. drought, right? There's a big uh, height sitting in the middle of the country uh, responsible for drought. However, if we look at different drought, we found actually pattern changing from drought to drought. Even within same drought, for example, 2012 grape plant drought, and we see the circulation pattern change every month. We don't even know how many patterns are responsible for drought and what cause, uh, how each of the uh, patterns contribute to the rainfall deficit or extreme temperature. So uh, these questions are really motivated our research. Uh, we want to see how many uh, patterns are responsible for drought and what are the thermodynamic condition and moisture transport associated with these patterns and the, what are the evolution and the precursor of these anomalous circulation patterns. We also want to know whether all of these patterns are created equal in terms of uh, their impact on drought, or perhaps the few leading patterns are more important than others. Next slide. So uh, the self-organizing mapping, this is our main uh, machine learning approach for this uh, study, is particularly suited for our research so self-organizing map, or SOM, uh, is an unsupervised neural network and focus on the, uh, the identified clusters of the pattern. Um, it's commonly used uh, for either dimension reduction or identify the cluster of the patterns. But different from the typical class, uh, cluster analysis, the SOM actually preserve, even emphasize the connection between different patterns. And also, the, uh, it keep track. This is a, not, uh, uh, this is, in my view, a very nice uh, capability, but underutilized uh, in the research showing literature. Is, uh, it can track the frequency persistence and the transition among different related patterns which is uh, identified as a neighboring node. So for our application, the, we have a, <clears throat> for our 
application. We have about 17, um, 17,000 different weather maps for our analysis period. The SOM act as a, really a superman with a photographic memory and uh, penetrating eyes. And SOM can identify the part reoccurring patterns among these, you know, 17,000 weather maps and also know what patterns occurred before this particular weather pattern of interest, what happened afterward, and organize them uh, in terms of uh, their similarity and uh, connection uh, as illustrated here. So uh, here, you, as you can see, uh, we use, uh, this is a seven by five different SOM node, uh, meaning this seven by five, uh, multiply five different patterns. And the SOM organize these similar low pressure patterns uh, into this area. And we can even track, not only we know the frequency and uh, uh, persistence of these patterns, we can actually track how these patterns evolve. For example, uh, this third pattern, oh, I guess you cannot see my cursor. So the third, uh, the third pattern in the first column evolved into fourth pattern. And so you can keep track on how these circulation patterns evolve, develop. You can also identify the precursor of these patterns. Uh, next slide. So our analysis approach uh, is described in this uh, slide. We first of all, we use the univary uh, SOM, um, apply that on rainfall temporal uh, pattern of the rainfall to identify temporal pattern of rainfall. In this way, we know how uh, the, the regime, we, we know how uh, temporal be, uh, rainfall, how rainfall variability uh, clustered or what are the main rainfall variability pattern over continental US. And then we use multivariant SOM, uh, including three different uh, fields, uh, standardize the anomalies of uh, 500 hectopascal dual potential height. This is uh, representing the circulation and also uh, the vertical integrated moisture transport, the uh, convective inhibition energy, which uh, really recording the, which represent the stability uh, near in, of the boundary layer, and which is connected to uh, land surface feedback, as documented by this paper, Mian Yang and uh, Nielsen Gaman. And we're going to focus on the warm season. Uh, so the SOM node can be, uh, the initial SM, SOM node can be any random vectors. And then you, through iteration rating processes, you fit the data uh, topography. But to speed up, uh, speed, up, speed up this training, we can uh, use the EOF to identify the uh, patterns. So we can so make an educated guess for the initial SOM pattern. And this actually greatly accelerate the training speed. And uh, so the only arbitrary uh, variable we can control for SOM is how many nodes, uh, what's their configuration. We actually tested many configuration to identify the optimal uh, node configuration. Next slide. So here is an example of a rainfall variability regime. And <clears throat> So they are organized by the SOM node. As we can see that uh, over the Western uh, US, the, they are, the rainfall regime are basically belong to same uh, class of the node. And that means they have similar variability and we can study them together. Where over Eastern US, uh, you can see another red colored clusters and they, in there, the rainfall variability behave very differently from west. The uh, southern, the great plant people used to study them as one region actually 
uh, the rainfall regime, the rainfall variability are quite different between southern grid plan and the central grid plan. And here you can look at the time series uh, on, let's say, on the top, the time series is the yellow uh, node, and you can look at uh, how this uh, rainfall variability associated with this node varies. And you can see the 2011 drought, uh, the red circle, and 1998 drought. So these uh, nodes uh, will capture the temporal variation of these rainfall. Next slide, please. So here, uh, this, is, this uh, diagram shows the uh, circulation pattern uh, derived from the SOM analysis and associate, uh, so he, uh, associate moisture transport and the convective inhibition energy uh, for each of the circulation patterns. So here, the contour represents the anomalous 500 hectopascal joule potential high, solid meaning higher and dash meaning low. The colored shade represents the vertical integrated moisture transport. Green means the increase in moisture transport and the brown means the decrease in moisture transport. The dotted area, uh, like red, indicate the increase of convective inhibition energy, meaning increase of stability suppressed convection, mainly due to land surface dryness. The blue means the decrease of convective inhibition energy, meaning the surface, uh, the, the boundary layer is uh, less stable. So uh, first, of, and we can then really look at how each of these patterns influence, contribute to the dryness uh, on the subseasonal scale, weather subseasonal scale, as shown by the histogram on the right. So if we look at the top right histogram, here the red color means the very dry days, and moderate color, uh, the orange color means dry days. And the blue color means wet or very wet days. We can identify the node on the left side of the top right panel. And these are the node circulation pattern that has the uh, main contribution to the dry, very dry days. Um, next, uh, move forward, like next. OK. So uh, we can map, we can identify the circulation pattern <clears throat> of this dry node as shown by the uh, node that's circled by this red. So there are primarily two types. One we call uh, uh, NLSH, meaning north, low, south, high. And as you can see from this map, the other pattern is a uh, dominant higher. Uh, as you can see from these um, bottom row of the uh, third column. We can also, uh, you, as you can see here for southern grade plan, you don't see very strong brown color, meaning the reduced moisture, moisture transport do not seem to be central. Instead, you see this red patch, that means the city, the convective inhibition energy increase seem to be associated with this pattern. This is consistent with previous study where the, um, the land surface feedback, land surface dryness has a, a dominant uh, contribution to the southern grid plant uh, warm season drought. Similarly, we can look at uh, the central grid plant next. Uh, yeah, here. So uh, there's the 11 uh, weather pattern that contribute to the dry spell over century, central grid plant. Here you see these brown color shade uh, suggesting that reduced moisture transport are actually quite important and associated with these uh, uh, circulation pattern. Next slide. So SOM, uh, the, the feature I really like, is allow us to uh, characterize the weather pattern in a probabilistic manner and also uh, tracking the evolution of these patterns, the connection, transition of these patterns. So here uh, we, 
we uh, can identify six different circulation patterns that really dominate the dry and the wet spell over continental uh, U.S. during the warm season. So the two blue circles represent the two dominant uh, wet circulation pattern. And one is uh, uh, the main one is the wet low east high pattern, and that happened 31% of the time. And the other less important uh, wet pattern is the dominant low pattern that happened 11 times, 11% uh, 11 of the time. The number in this little circle represent the persistence of these patterns. For example, the dry pattern here, uh, the north highest south low, um, NHSL, the persistence, like 23% uh, percent of these patterns persist more than 14 days. So we have uh, uh, four dry uh, patterns that are responsible for dry spells. And we can, uh, in overall, the white pattern happened 41%, uh, 42% uh, of time, whereas the dry pattern happened 58% of time. And this is climatologically, gave us climatological rainfall. We can also see the, the, uh, the transition, right? You'll see predominantly these dry uh, pattern uh, transition into white pattern as, you, uh, as indicated by this uh, bold, thick arrows. So um, overall, the uh, transition the, the the transition from dry to wet pattern are actually uh, our way the transition from wet to dry pattern. So this means uh, if you have a dry weather and the tendency, the probability for you for that to transition or to be replaced by wet pattern is pretty high, and that produce rainfall limit the uh, the dryness of the summer climatologically. Next slide. So now the question is uh, how do these weather patterns uh, contribute to drought? Next slide. To uh, explore this question, we first look at climatologically what pattern, uh, circulation pattern, are mainly responsible to the uh, dry spell and especially the very dry spell. The very dry spell here is determined by the driest the one sixth of the summer days, of the warm season days. So we identify uh, these patterns, as you can see here. These are very important circulation patterns for dry spell climatologically. Next. So uh, now let's look at how these uh, dry spell pattern contribute to drought. So on the left uh, panel, we can see the uh, drought events. And the number of the very dry days here are used to characterize the drought severity. And not surprisingly, 2011 drought is the strongest over Southern Great Plan. So by the way, these are for Southern Great Plan. And now we have 98 drought and 20 and so on. What we can see is uh, there are some nodes that have disproportional contribution to these very strong or extreme drought. For example, this uh, node B3 that has the largest contribution to dry spell climatologically actually contribute to almost 50% of the uh, 2011 drought and 20, uh, 20, uh, 2000. So uh, if we look at the next note, uh, the next, yeah. And so the, uh, also you can see that, uh, uh, per perhaps we can hit the pattern, uh, button next so I can show. So bottom line here is uh, these uh, circulation pattern that has the largest contribution to dry spell climatologically. They seem to be the main, uh, so they have, a, uh, they contribute to almost 50% of the dry days during the strong drought. But during the weak drought, the contribution from different dry nodes are very spread. 
it's hard to identify the dominant uh, mode weather pattern that contribute to these weak drop. Uh, next. So here is the main conclusion. Uh, I feel this is good news, a few leading anomalous circulation patterns as represented by SOM nodes are responsible for very dry day, uh, that responsible for very dry day climate logically, have a disproportionately large contribution to strong drought. That means if we focus on understanding what caused increased frequency persistence of these uh, main nodes, a weather pattern, and uh, what are the precursors of these uh, weather patterns, we might be able to improve the predictive, uh, predictive understanding of this drop. Next slide. Of the strong drop. So this slide, uh, in this slide, we basically show the circulation pattern that is responsible uh, for at least 50% of the very dry days for these major drought. So we can see that uh, the north low south high pattern are dominant uh, for the strong extreme drought over southern Great Plan. And the dominant high also contribute to uh, these uh, severe or uh, extreme drought over the southern Great Plan. Next. Sorry about this animation. Yeah, here is just a summary of that. Next slide. So now we can also look at the probabilistically. How do these weather dry wet pattern change? So for the southern great plan, uh, we can see that first of all, two out of four uh, dry weather patterns have increased substantially. In particular, this uh, North low south high pattern, as we showed in the last slide, has, in, has increased 60%, become 60% more frequent and 50% more persistent. The other pattern, uh, dominant high, we also see in the previous slide, increase uh, become about 30% more frequent and more persistent. The dryness, the drought, is also contributed by decrease of the white uh, node, white pattern, especially this dominant low pattern uh, become 50% less frequent, almost 50% less persistent. So the white pattern now become infrequent and they don't last very long. And uh, in contrast, uh, this uh, uh, the main contributor white pattern, the west low east high, and they are decrease, uh, the decrease is less severe. We can also uh, see why these um, dry pattern increase. Uh, one of the reasons is uh, the night transition from this white pattern to this dry pattern has increased by order of magnitude, 125%. Um, so actually, not order of magnitude, but by more than 100%. And also the transition from dry to wet pattern has decreased by almost 60%. So this kind of information could be extremely useful for the, uh, for evaluate as a uh, observational basis for evaluate uh, the seamless prediction, for evaluate the model for seamless prediction. Next, next slide. So here is the summary of these uh, uh, result like reiterating, and although many weather patterns contribute to dry spell and moderate drought, uh, fortunately strong drought seem to be contributed by a few leading weather patterns that are responsible for very dry spell climatologically. Therefore, we can uh, first focus on these leading patterns, understand the cause for changing the frequency persistence uh, of these patterns, and uh, transition precursors of these uh, weather patterns to understand what caused extreme drop and also to uh, see whether the climate model could adequately capture these leading patterns that contribute to extreme drop. Next slide. Okay, so the next question is, uh, uh, 
uh, how do decadal variability and human forced climate change influence weather and subseasonal climate variability? Next slide. So use example of the weather events for the 2020 Oxford complex fire. This is the largest fire recorded uh, in the history of the California. And the circulation pattern that is responsible for extreme fire weather is shown here, 500 hectopascal geopotential potential height. The shade represents the anomalies, uh, standardized anomalies. So you can see these red color, meaning the geopotential potential height anomalies actually reach almost uh, three sigma, which means this is a 99 percentile of the extreme. It is truly extreme. The question here is, uh, is this extreme circulation pattern uh, fully responsible for the uh, extreme fire weather at the surface? Next slide. So to address this question, we use another machine learning approach called the uh, constructed flow analog approach. So uh, the way this analog approach works is uh, for a given weather pattern, we can ask uh, what surface condition, uh, to what extent this weather pattern can explain surface condition, and based on the same weather pattern happened in the past. So to uh, answer, to address this question, we can uh, reconstruct the circulation pattern for this particular weather event based on a set. In this case, we use 20 same or very similar circulation pattern that happened in the same season, but in the past, in the reference period. For example, 79 to 2010. And then we can, uh, once we are able to reproduce this weather pattern or reconstruct this weather circulation pattern using the same circulation pattern in the past, then we can reconstruct the surface condition based on these reconstructed weather pattern called the analog pattern. And then see whether this is reconstructed the surface condition matches that observed in reality. This is also called analog surface condition. The surface condition here uh, are the vapor pressure deficits defined as uh, saturation vapor pressure minus the air vapor pressure uh, here. Next slide. So the uh, analog construction actually is uh, sensitive to how many analog you use, how do you define a similarity or same circulation pattern, whether it's a use, we use the Euclidean distance or Pearson's correlation or Spearman's ranked correlation, that all impact uh, our analog reconstructed circulation pattern. And also a uh, different real analysis uh, could influence your analog uh, pattern and uh, also uh, how you uh, decide the geographic domain where you uh, determine the circulation the pattern similarity also affect the result. So to count for this uncertainty, we actually uh, construct uh, 180 different analog schemes using these uh, four different reanalysis, three different ways to define the um, similarity of the circulation pattern and the different the three different geographic domain. And then we use mean of this estimated analog from uh, this 180 analog scheme as the analog estimate value that you will see in the next few slides. And the uncertainty is a 25 to 35 quantile of this 180 analog scheme. Next, I better be quick. So here, uh, we see the, this is the for 2020 warm season, fire season over Western US average over this domain. And from May 1st to October 1st, the observed uh, uh, VPD vapor pressure deficit is the red line you can see here. And the VPD for Oxford 
complex fire is indicated here, and the quick fire is indicated in September is indicated here. So you see extremely high uh, BPD here. And then the, um, the other uh, line, the origin line, is the saturation vapor pressure, meaning the temperature impact contribution to VPD. And the blue line is the contribution of moisture to VPD. The black line here is the analog VPD. Basically, is the VPD we should get or we expect to get based on the circulation happened during this fire season. And basically ask if the same circulation happened in the past, what will be the VPD at the surface? So you can see that uh, the analog VPD only explain half of the uh, VPD observed. And the main contribution of such extreme VPD is the temperature, is the extreme temperature. The moisture contribution is far less. Next slide. So we can also look at the PDF, probably distribution of the VPD uh, during the uh, reference period from 79 to 2010, and versus the VPD of last year, 2020, and the analog VPD, which is uh, the what we VPD related to circulation pattern. So now you can see that the uh, 2020, the observed VPD here is uh, five to six hectopascal higher than the uh, mean of the reference period of APD. Um, this is about two standard deviation higher than the climatology reference period. And the analog of APD is uh, only half of the observed VPD uh, PDF. The analog, the shift of analog VPD is only half of that uh, of observed VPD. So this and you can also see the map, right? The observed map show VPD exceed 99, 95, 100% uh, of the reference uh, period, whereas analog mostly are limited to uh, below 90%. Sorry about that. Next slide. And we can also compare the VPD of the two uh, between the end of the uh, two decades of the end of 20th century, 79 to 2000, and the 2001 to uh, 2020, we also see the uh, significant shift of a VPD towards higher, uh, towards the higher uh, values. So there is a systematic shift of uh, surface dryness, uh, mainly due to warming over Southwest. Next slide. So now uh, let's look at uh, the time series uh, of the VPD over Western US and also see how the changing of the atmospheric circulation uh, contribute to the uh, VPD trend over the last uh, uh, almost four decades. <clears throat> so here, the observed uh, VPD is a black line, and the analog VPD, meaning the VPD changing due to circulation change, is a blue line. So we can see that from 80s to uh, before 2000, the observed VPD and the analog VPD are relatively well overlap uh, with each other, meaning the VPD changing during that period are mainly due to circulation changing, perhaps just the climate variability, natural variability of the circulation. But since 2000, you see the separation between observed VPD and analog VPD, meaning that the circulation changing, pattern change, now cannot fully explain the increase of VPD. Now, if we look at the fraction of the VPD change that can be explained uh, by circulation changing state by state, and you can see that they only explain about 30% of the increase of VPD. In another word, if we get right circulation pattern, uh, 
will only capture the increase of APD 30% by a third of the increase of APD. Next slide. So we also done our attribution study uh, using both flow analog and versus the CMIP-5 simulation. So the flow analog suggests only, as I mentioned, only a third of the increase of the VPD uh, since 2000 can be explained by decadal variation of atmospheric circulation pattern. Two thirds uh, is attributable to, attributable to surface warming, unrelated to atmospheric circulation. We also mostly cannot be explained by the change of the uh, surface radiation and the vegetation. So they're just, they're likely to be anthropogenic induced warming. And this would seem to be consistent with the CMIM-5 uh, simulation. So here, CMIM-5 actually says that 90% of the increase of APD for Western US is attributed to, both to the anthropogenic forcing. Next slide. So what does that mean? If we look at the burn area over Western US, as shown by the histogram on the top panel, uh, it's very well correlated with the change of VPD as shown by the black line here. So if the circulation changing can only explain a third of the uh, increase of weather, fire weather risk at the surface, that implies the risk for underpredict severity of the fire weather and the heat wave at a subseasonal and a seasonal scale increase with time because less and less uh, circulation pattern could explain the extreme condition at the surface. And this is mainly due to the warming at the surface. Next slide. So now I want to come back to the lack of poor prediction scale. Recall we show that uh, the last uh, summer, um, the climate seasonal forecast really underpredict the warming, as shown by the uh, right bottom panel. Right, they predict uh, they didn't predict a strong warming, and in, in fact, there's some cooling anomalies. When in reality, we have a record higher temperature over southwest. So uh, this, uh, why there are many reasons could be responsible to failure of this prediction. And I wonder whether uh, the, I wonder whether this, uh, the un uncounted for climate influence on weather and subsidence variability is also contributing to this uh, under prediction of the heat wave. And also, if we look at the uh, decrease of the predictions, uh, simulate decrease of prediction scale, I also wonder whether the, um, we really need to consider the impact of climate changing uh, in these, uh, even the seasonal, subseasonal prediction. Next slide. Okay, finally, uh, I want to highlight another challenge and this is a compound effect of a drought heat wave and the wildfire. As these drought heat wave and the wildfire become uh, more and more uh, frequent and uh, uh, far reaching, the coupling, the positive feedback between them uh, could become an important factor in determining the weather and the uh, extreme weather and climate conditions. Therefore, they could be potentially important for weather climate prediction. As we know, this uh, interaction between the drought, fire, and the uh, extreme uh, temperature happened both on the, uh, through the physical uh, climate processes like aerosol impact on the cloud rainfall on a shorter time scale, but also on the ecological, uh, involved ecological processes and the hydrological processes on the longer scale. So these factors are really not being uh, accounted for uh, in the weather climate prediction, at least not adequately. So to highlight, uh, uh, to understand that we, are, we know very little about these compound effects, 
And in fact, this is one of the focus, focus, uh, focus research focus of the NOAA Job Task Force uh, Phase 4. So to draw attention, uh, to draw community attention to this uh, uh, new challenge, and I worked with uh, other uh, job task uh, co-leader to uh, publish the paper on EOS. And JPL, and this is a really Earth system problem that NOAA is not necessarily equipped to address. And JPL is known for, this is a powerhouse of uh, interdisciplinary research across physical, biological, and chemical uh, sphere of the Earth system. And I really hope uh, we have opportunity to work together to address this challenge. Next slide. So uh, now I want to come to conclusion, going back to this uh, take home message. Uh, I really feel uh, when I start research, I only want to focus on climate, seasonal to longer time scale. But I think this machine learning, the, the, the uh, result of this machine learning uh, uncovered during this research, uh, during our research, uh, really helped me understand the importance of weather and the climate linkage in improve the uh, predictive understanding and the ultimately prediction um, from both weather to climate scale. I, and thank you very much for your time. And I hope we can work together to address this challenge. Thank you. Strong for presentation. Um, I think we have time for a few questions. I, I noticed that there are three questions on the chat box. So I would start with those, and then if we have some time, we'll go to other ones, if that's okay. So I, will, I think the first one is from Sun Wong, which was Sun Wong followed by Amy, followed by Michael. And that was Sun Wong. Sun Wong? Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. Should I read it? Uh, no, I think oh. I was, Sun Wong, can, can oh, you? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, Amy and I have uh, uh, related questions. My my question is, when you do SOM, uh, what is your temporal resolution? Uh, is that daily data or, or, or hourly data, et cetera? Let me ask. Uh, in this Amy case, asked, we use the daily data. Oh, and then Amy asked the spatial resolution and how temporal and spatial resolution um, influence your result. Uh, in this case, oh, sorry, does not influence too much because uh, the spatial resolution uh, is dependent on the real analysis. Uh, we mainly, so it's one degree to uh, around one degree. Uh, to the two degree spatial, uh, like spatial resolution. The, uh, we have enough of a grid point. It doesn't seem to really affect. And also our analysis domain for SOM is actually not only cover the North American, but also part of the Pacific. So we haven't seen, we did vary domain, didn't seem to change much. And um, we also, uh, we haven't really uh, tested the temporal resolution because, you know, we got like uh, tens of thousands of the maps. I don't feel uh, small change in the temporal resolution. Unless we, say, get into diurnal cycle, uh, if we choose particular phase of diurnal cycle, we might see some difference, uh, but we haven't tested that yet. That's a really good question. Okay, thank you for your answer. Sen, I think you had another question about the multivariate uh, approach. Do you want, you want to ask that question? Uh, yeah. Uh, when you do the multivariate SOM, why don't you include precipitation with other variables like uh, 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 integrate vapor transport or steam? That's actually a very good question because 
we we are uh, we are using daily data. The daily precipitation is very patchy, and they right at the given day that precipitation tend to be uh, relatively local during the warm season because these are mostly thermodynamics driven. Uh, even they're organized by circulation, but they are um, they're not like winter rainfall to be dominant by very large uh, spatial structure. So we did include the rainfall at the beginning, but it really uh, affect clear identification identification of the circulation. So the uh, multivariate UF here was designed to capture more larger scale patterns. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. If we use the monthly mean, I, I think we can incorporate rainfall because then you have a smoother rainfall field uh, for the for pattern identification. Thank you. Uh, so we do have a couple of questions. So there's a couple of questions from Mike Gray and a question from uh, Nick Parazu. So Mike, do you want to ask a question? Or maybe one of them. Sure. I think I think probably the first question is maybe more interesting. I think um, I, I was you showed August 2020 as being a, a three sigma event, and then you went and tried to do an analog for it, so the return of analog forecasting. And um, I'm surprised you could find any analogs at all in the data set, given the fact that you're looking at a three sigma event, right? Wouldn't every single other event you could possibly find be less than that? So the fact that you're uh, analogs are giving you less uh, extremes is not surprising to me at all because you're kind of looking at the most extreme event in your data set and trying to find analogs to predict that. Um, yeah, that's that's really, problematic. Yeah, that's a really good question. The way we do that is you're absolutely right. That uh, circulation pattern is uh, on like almost 99 uh, percentile, right? Uh, but we use multilinear regression uh, to basically reproduce the pattern we see, and we could, uh, by increasing our regression coefficient, uh, we can, right, even the past pattern are not as strong, uh, but we can identify a similar pattern, and we just use the increased co the regression coefficient to uh, force match that pattern. And then we use that regression coefficient to uh, when we reconstruct circulation, you're going to amplify the um, surface condition uh, associated with that pattern as well. So we use, yeah, like, uh, does that explain your question? Even we don't have the exactly same, uh, the, we have a similar pattern, but they're not as strong, but we could, uh, construct a circulation pattern uh, that as strong as that happened associated with the um, associated with the August complex fund. Thank you, Rong. I think we have probably time for just one last question. Uh, we already over time by a minute, but uh, yes. Nick uh, Perazu, do you want to ask a question? Hi, right, sure. Hi, thanks, Rong, for that nice presentation. I know we've been talking for a while about looking at vegetation um, influences on your predictions. Um, have you had a chance to look at that um, in any detail to see if it has a significant influence? Uh, that's a really great question. Um, I haven't looked at it, but that's a, uh, we definitely want to look into that. Uh, in fact, Paul Diermeyer uh, made a really good comment. He said, uh, for some of the drought, you see a lot of a small different uh, circulation, and why you have a dominant mode, right? Dominant circulation. The other half is contributed by a whole bunch of the weather pattern. Each of them doesn't seem to be, uh, uh, each of them contribute part of it. So he suggests maybe that is uh, uh, organized by the uh, land surface feedback 
meaning the vegetation could be uh, uh, played a quite important role. But um, I have not figured out how to uh, capture that effect. However, I feel we could look at uh, how land surface uh, contribute to the increase of persistence of these uh, dry node, um, but just using you know more conventional process study. But I haven't figured out how to counter for the vegetation impact on the circulation pattern change. Uh, I know Randy Koster did work in that area, like you know he used model changing the surface uh, conditions, see how circulation pattern responds. Maybe that's a a really good way to explore this question. But I definitely agree with you. That's uh, something we need to look into, especially for the southern great plan. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rong. Could you give more offline about that? I think there's okay, a yeah. lot of predictive power, yeah. not just for the drought and heat waves, but for also fire prediction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. Uh -huh. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Ron, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for attending and taking minutes late. Um, Ron, I think we have a schedule for you, so uh, let us know. Let Lindsay and I know if there's something that's not working. So if you go into a WebEx meeting and it's not working for some reason, just let us know. Okay. Uh, I, I think you have all the information that you need. Yeah. Uh, I will see you later after lunch. Uh, thank you again. Yeah. And, um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for coming to this seminar. Really appreciate yeah, it. Thank you. Wing. Yeah. Thanks, Wingsy, for organizing it. See you later, Ron. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.